bloody greetings, Slashaholics. Be sure to subscribe. And click that bell! Yeah, yeah, Freddy, yes. Click the bell, that way you know of all the new Slasher Mayhem brewing in the 80s Slasher Library. And click that like button, or I'll make sure you never have pleasant dreams again! And be sure to follow the 80 Slasher Librarian on Twitter. Join the Facebook group and the subreddit. The links are in the description below. Join now, or playtime will be over. <laughs> this upload is brought to you by the patrons of the 80 Slasher Librarian. Alleyway, Bonanza Jellybean, Bree, Carl Eakins, Cecilia Spears, Allison Seib, Hawaii, Iron Alexa, Jay Gardner, Catherine McClear, Kristen K, Lauren Vaught, Liam Anderson, Michael, Ryan Woodward, Sean Campbell, William Schaefer, and Willow Ravenwood. If you would like to support the 80 Slasher Librarian YouTube channel, then check the description below for a link to the merch store and the Patreon. Enjoy tonight's narration. Blood and Guts on the Stairs in the Bathroom Floor 2 by T.C. Keeper Imagine that there is a big old house atop a hill. The house is painted all white, but the paint is flaking off in big pieces. But it doesn't matter because it is dark outside anyway and there is no porch light. But lightning flashes now and then you... You could see it after all, the flaking paint. Now go inside the house, in your imagination. And imagine there is a pile of clothes in a heap on the floor of a bedroom. The house is so big it has six, no, eight, eight bedrooms. In your imagination, you are in one of them. And there is a big pile of clothes and now you see that they're all bloody. The blood is red. You can tell because the light is on in the bathroom and man, talk about red. Then there is this woman standing there taking off her blouse, which is all bloody from her just having hacked her husband up real bad. In fact, she is in her underwear and feels like taking a nice hot bath after having hacked up her husband so badly. But now the phone rings. She answers by saying, Hello? Into the phone after she picks it up. It's her lover. That is why she hacked up her husband just before the story started. Because she was having an affair with another dude. She tells her lover now that yes, she had done it. He is hacked up real bad. Then she says, I'm going to take a shower now. So she goes into the bathroom. The house is so big it has ten bathrooms. And she goes into the closest one. In the mirror she sees herself and smiles. And her teeth are all bloody. Like maybe she was eating the body or something. But while she's in the bathtub, her husband is coming back to life. He has been hacked up, but now his body, which she put in the basement in a barrel of acid, starts moving and wiggling. 
blood, guts, intestines, his liver, his lymph nodes, his heart, which has started beating again. So what is left of Walter crawls up the basement steps with the axe that she used still sticking out of his skull. The house is so big it has 14 stairways, and he must crawl up all of them, and it takes him a long while. But she is taking a long bath upstairs, so he has time. Finally, he pulls the axe out of his head and opens the door. Amanda doesn't notice this yet because she has put a wash rag over her eyes to get rid of her makeup. So when the door opens and he is there holding the axe, she doesn't see. Then Walter crawls in and lifts the axe over his head. He has only one arm left, so it is hard. He raises it up, up, up. Blood and goop slide down the wooden axe handle. Suddenly, Amanda notices, and the axe makes a sound like whoosh, like a subway train. Loud like that because her husband is swinging it so hard. It splits her head real bad. Blood squirts all over the walls and radiator and sink. Walter says, Touche. But then Amanda comes back to life. She kills him again. Then he kills her. And they do it until they are nothing but slices and pieces, like noodles and pasta or dog food. Then her lover comes over and finds them like that, little squiggly pieces that can never die. The End Hello, kitties. Pretty bad, huh? This is your old fiend, the Crypt Keeper. I wrote that little horror story six months ago as my first assignment in the famous Dead Riders course. It's a mail-order correspondence course designed to turn mediocre writers into top-notch frighters. Ever read any books by Clive Darker, Scream Koontz, John Skull, or everybody's favorite, Stephen Cringe? That's how they all learn how to write so well. With this publication of this book, I join their ranks, and I'm ranker than they'll ever be. Probably richer now, too. Yes, the famous Dead Riders course turned a fledgling Edgar Ailing Poe like myself into what I am now, the author of the book you are listening to right now. If this book sells enough copies, they might make a movie into it. And if they do, your favorite TC Keeper will write the screenplay and direct the movie myself. You can bet your life on it, if you still have one after hearing this story. In the next several hours, you'll meet 13 people who have a very peculiar night ahead of them. Death stalks us all. But tonight, Death has chosen especially to stalk a lonesome dot on the map called Wormwood, an already dying town in the parched deserts of New Mexico that will soon find itself in a battle the size of all creation itself. So sit back, Fright fans. Make yourself a bubbling cup of arsenic or warm blood, and open your ears wider. My finely boned writing skills will now take you away to an empty highway in the shadow of the Superstition Mountains, where a bloated full moon hangs in the velvet sky, and the devil himself is about to claw his way to the surface, looking for you. Okay, boils and ghouls, I call this story Demon Night. <laughs> Tales from the Crypt, Demon Knight, the novelization by Randall Boyle. Chapter 1 For Deputy Sheriff Bob Martell, these Saturday night patrols were the only part of his job that made being a cop worthwhile. He had joined the force four years ago after an uneventful stint in the army, into which he had enlisted with the hope of shooting... Crots or gooks or Iranians or who the hell ever Uncle Sam didn't like at the time. Instead, the army assigned him to be an ammunition handler in the artillery, which meant hauling 100-pound shells out of wooden cases and passing them up the line to the Big Bang Bang gun. Since there was, to his regret, no war going on at the time, the howitzers shot at dusty hillsides on the Oklahoma prairie, where a big puff of exploded sagebrush was the only reward. How he had hated it. But now... Now, Bob Martell was in his element. The night was new and not quite as black as it soon would be, and from his hiding position behind a billboard on this long stretch of New Mexico highway, Bob was in a perfect position to spot speeding cars. There was something in the air above Highway 47, 
he had decided a couple months ago that whatever it was just made people want to floor the gas pedal and see how many miles per hour the speedometer could streak through. There were times when his souped-up patrol car, actually an elderly Ford Galaxy with a bad case of the wheezes, had trouble catching up with the perpetrators of crimes against speeding. The drivers were perps, as Bob Martell liked to call them, but the road was a straight shot for 18 miles and the Ford could generate 160 on a stretch like that, so no perp could outrun him in the end. The sun was becoming a memory now as darkness settled in deeper. Sitting in the soft glow of assorted dash lights, his mirror sunglasses reflecting green squares, Bob lifted his deputy's hat for a moment and scratched at his bushy hair. He dropped it back on his head and checked his watch. 10.30 almost. Just about time for the teeny bopper crowd from Lost Mesa to roar out of the hamburger joints there and hightail it to Avery, where half a dozen bars rarely check for ID and the other half dozen never did. Deputy Martell knew very well that if he had the patience, these same kids would roar from Avery back to Lost Mesa drunk off their asses and he could hand out DWIs like Christmas candy. But he couldn't wait. His shift ended at midnight tonight, and Sheriff Tupper, the human well that was Bob's boss, would take over the reins of duty. This was the part of the job that galled Bob Martell so much. He was young and physically fit, could walk on his freaking knuckles faster and farther than Sheriff Tupper could ever walk on his big, fat, flat feet. But the son of a bitch outranked him and got all the choice missions and the choice perps. But not tonight. It was almost 11 when the first true speeder swooshed past the billboard where Martell was lurking. It was a dark and shiny Pontiac Firebird convertible, with the top folded all the way down and the driver's foot crushed to the floor so hard his heel was digging up asphalt. Deputy Martell, his nerves already humming with anticipation, grinned as his hand jerked to the dashboard and flipped the switch that made his overhead bar of red, whites, and blues flash on. This guy had to be doing 80 or 90, 100 even. He had nearly sucked the Holiday Inn advertisement off the billboard with such speed. He was now demoted from the rank of driver to the rank of perp, and Deputy Martell had every happy intention of catching him and making him regret every inch of this felonious highway misuse. Martell slapped his hand to the official key stuck in the column, cranked it, and popped the headlights fully on. He slammed the gear shift from park into drive and crunched the gas pedal down, already spinning the steering wheel hard to the right. The phrase, yee-haw, leapt out of his mouth, bouncing up and down on the seat in his brown and yellow uniform, his cop lights making colored flashes in the dark. He poured on the speed and gave chase. He thought. It took a second. His elbows stopped flapping and his grin faded into a confused frown. He looked up. He looked down. He looked at the disappearing taillights of the Pontiac, looked at the glowing instrument panel, which made his tight little face look like Martian green. BITCH! He cranked the key again, this time listening to hear if the Ford's motor wanted to start or not. It did, then quit, then ran again. Strange activities took place under the hood. Knocks and groans and steamy things that hissed and quit, then hissed again and smelled to Deputy Martell like the mentholated steam he'd had to inhale as a child because of asthma. Junkyard pile of shit! He screamed when everything died again. He pounded the steering wheel with his open hands. Run, bitch, run! God damn it, the perp is halfway to Albuquerque already, please! Chugga, 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 boom, rattle, die. He could have wept until the next car roared past. The Holiday Inn sign seemed to suck inward as the noise came. When the black Cadillac shot past with the breathy roar, the sign puffed out and wobbled on its post, threatening to fall all the way over. Deputy Martell hauled in a wondering breath while the car's taillights painted thin red streaks across the lenses of the sunglasses. Major perps here, folks. Someone needed a ticket in a very, very bad way. Martell was reaching to try the key again when the Firebird's wheels locked up and it went into a long, tire-burning skid. The headlights lurched into view, were replaced by the taillights as the car spun, then came into view again, filtered through dense blue tire smoke. It screamed to a stop, blocking both lanes of the highway. Martell bleated and groaned as the old Ford's engine cranked and cranked without coming fully to life. He watched in helpless fascination as the black Cadillac bore down on the Firebird. 
its headlights piercing the night in two jittering cones that winked and flashed off the Firebird's dusty hide. Rather than slowing, the Cadillac seemed to be speeding up, probably going better than 80 now, maybe 90. Martel's police cruiser jumped to sudden life. He smashed the shift lever down with his fist and gave the old Ford a big new dent under the gas pedal. Tires spun and cooked as two huge founts of gravel and dirt shot from the wheels to clatter against the holiday inside. Fishtailing crazily, Martel found the road and gave chase. He saw the door of the Firebird hinge open. He saw the barrel of some kind of gun, a rifle maybe. Then a dark figure levered upward. Flame popped out of it at once. Twice. The windshield of the Cadillac imploded, yet still it gained speed. Martel thought, but could not be sure at this insane pace, that he saw the dark figure leap from the open Firebird and somersault away from it, down into the ditch beside the road. At perhaps 100 miles per hour now, the Cadillac closed the last few yards. The head of the driver was very visible in Martel's headlights. A driver making no move to slow down or swerve or do anything to avoid a collision. The two cars met. The explosion as they were welded to each other was huge and bright, making Martel cross his arms over his eyes and reminding him very much of the artillery range at Fort Sill, where he had humped bombs for so long. The noise was gigantic, a tremendous kawoom that nearly blew his hat off his head. He mashed both feet onto the brake pedal and sent the Ford into a long, loping curve that nearly ended in the ditch. Burning drops of molten metal rained down, cracking his windshield and utterly ruining the wax job he had given the Ford not a week ago with his own elbow grease. It did not concern him for long. White and yellow flames geysered into the black sky, lighting the entire area and throwing long, twisting shadows across the desert floor and its collection of sagebrush. He grabbed for the radio mic, missed it, tried again. Mavis, you there? He waited. Mavis Dornberry was not famous for staying awake during the night shift. Mavis, come in, damn it! The radio crackled. Her tired voice came through as grumpy and lifeless as a yawn. Yeah, Bob, what now? Get Sheriff Tupper, get him fast. There's, there's been a humongo car crash out here on 47 just outside of town. Bag the perp yet? she asked with infinite sarcasm. Martell noticed that his hands were shaking. Hell, all of him was shaking. Cut the crap, Mavis. I'm not in the mood for it. Rattle Tupper's chain and get his big fat ass out here now. Got me? You're got, okay? She replied nastily. Out. Martell swung his door open and stepped out, covering the top of his head with his arms, wary of the ashes and debris that were still pattering down all around him. The heat from the burning cars kept him at a respectful distance. He looked over to the ditch where he thought the man had landed after piling out of the Firebird, but it was a long strip of burning gasoline no one could have survived. Besides, the explosion alone probably did him in. No one could have been within 50 yards without getting his arms and legs blown off by the concussion. He skirted the wreck. Acrid smoke burned his nostrils, smelling mostly of fried paint and cooked foam rubber. Doubtless, the guy in the Cadillac was in there deader than dog shit and burning like a torch. But he decided that the drunken bastard probably deserved it. Both of them did for speeding like that. He stepped back to the cruiser, which was now idling quite nicely with no hint at having been asleep on duty. Scowling, he launched a flat-footed kick at the passenger door that left a respectable dimple in the aging sheet metal. See if he would ever wax the renegade son of a bitch again. Something tapped his shoulder then. He brushed quickly at it, cringing in case it was something on fire. It was. The tall man standing behind him had wisps of smoke drifting from tattered holes in his suit. His face was streaked with soot, and his tie had been burnt all the way up to the knot at his neck. Yeah! Martell exclaimed, for lack of anything better. Pardon me, the man said. Did you happen to see which way that other fellow went? Hubba! Martell informed him stupidly. Dubba, dubba, hubba. Please, please try to think, the burning man said. I simply must find him. Martell raised an arm and pointed to the wreckage. Da, da, east, that way. He nodded, shook his head, nodded again, 
At any moment now, he assumed he would wake up and find he had dozed off behind the Holiday Inn sign. Very well, the man said. He primly flicked a fallen ash off the back of his hand. Martel saw a very nice gold watch around his wrist. The glass crystal was milky white from having melted recently. In the other hand, he held a small leather case that looked just as bad. The man sketched a brief salute. You've been too kind. And I am very sorry about the mess. Indeed, Lee, sorry. He started away. Martel found his mind at last. But, but how? He flapped his hands, pointed at the wreckage. How did you? The man smiled. Airbags. You just gotta love them. Wonderful safety device. Ingenious discovery, really. Stupendous invention. Seatbelts help a lot, too. Now let me be the first, sir, to say goodbye. He walked away. Martel found himself waving bye-bye like an idiot. Wait! He called out, but already the man had vanished into the desert. Chapter 2 Danny Long was only eight years old, but he felt like 80 tonight. During the years the little town called Wormwood died its slow death, he had seen friends and classmates leave the place in droves, along with their mommies and daddies, of course. Now Wormwood was officially dead. There was nothing left here anymore but a boarding house and one tired old gas station, and even they were about to go belly up. His mother and father owned and operated the Eureka Cafe on the edge of town which was kept alive only by the handful of tourists who would bumble in sometimes asking directions to Albuquerque or the like, and wind up staying for chow. Even the school had closed its doors, and Danny was tutored at home by Cordelia Jackson, the town's only whore. Life was odd in Wormwood. It was about to get odder. He was sitting in the dark on the old wooden porch of the Eureka Cafe, killing time while his mom and dad cleaned up for the night. His dad, Homer, was currently putting all the chairs onto the red and white checkered tables so his mom could mop up the floor, complaining all the while. Her name was Wanda. So Danny had a crew of oddballs named Homer and Wanda for parents. Homer the Clown and Wanda the Wicked Witch of the West. Added also to the roster of names was a certain fellow named Roach, who did some cooking and some cleaning in exchange for free food and a couple of dollars a day. This dowdy existence and these dowdy people formed the sight and sound of Danny's life. Homer, Wanda, and Roach, and of course Cadelia Jackson, the jaded former school teacher turned prostitute. Who wouldn't be sick of it? Dolesville all the way even for an eight-year-old. And now, inside the cafe, as it settled down for the night, his mom and dad began the usual late-night arguing. Danny considered covering his ears, but he knew the routine almost by heart. Come on, Homer, get a move on. The way you're moving, it'll be dawn before we're done. That would be Wanda. This would be Homer. You know, if you ever got off your fat ass and helped, we might get home a little faster. After a bit of this, Roach chimed in. Put a lid on it, will you? I got a date tonight. And on and on. Dolesville all the way. Nothing ever happened at the Eureka Cafe except lousy food and loud bickering. Nothing. Danny Long was almost dozing in the dark when crunching footsteps made themselves known on the pothole street. A shadow loomed in the moonlight, thick and distorted, bobbing to its owner's footfalls. Then the footsteps grew slower, quieter. Somebody was trying to be sneaky all of a sudden. Danny guessed, and doing a bad job of it. Directly in front of him sat two elderly cars gleaming mellowly under the moonlight the ailing family Bronco, and the truck that Roach liked to tool around in like some kind of big shot. Beyond them lay the rest of the town where only a few houses cast any kind of light through their windows and the rest were boarded up. The owner of the footsteps crept into view, a man with his shoulders hunched quite criminally and his head swiveling from side to side in the dark. As he moved, his face caught a wedge of moonlight and held it a moment. Danny, crunching himself a little tighter as he sat in the safety of the dark, took mental notes, a stranger about as old as his father, kind of tall and kind of thin. Weeds and pieces of sagebrush stuck out of his hair. His skin was shiny with sweat and his eyes gleamed like big black olives. The stranger edged closer. 
Something flashed in his hand briefly, just long enough for Danny to see. A knife with a long chrome blade and big neat holes in the folding handles. Danny's friend Mark Olson had found one like that out by the highway a few years back, just before he moved away. But his dad made him throw it away. Besides, it was all bent and rusty, but not this one. The one the stranger was advancing with. The man stopped at the passenger door of the Bronco, eyeballed things for a minute, then went to work trying to jimmy the lock. Metal crunched and squealed in tiny spurts of sound. Though Danny's heart had slipped into a higher gear, he felt no fear at all. This dark man attacking the door of the Bronco was interesting as hell. Far more interesting than what Wormwood usually had to offer. Yet he felt compelled to speak. It was, after all, his dad's only set of wills. So, like, what are you doing? He offered into the silence. The stranger became a motionless block of darkness. A bit of moonbeam glimmed on the topmost part of his head, where a small twig of tumbleweed stuck up out of his hair like a blonde cowlick. Are you trying to cut off my daddy's bronco handle? The shape attempted a reply. Uh. Maybe even steal it? The shape stepped closer. Danny scooted backward, ready to holler if murder became a part of these odd going-ons. I'm a lock checker, the stranger said. Yours checks out fine, and say, how would you like a nice shiny quarter, young friend? Uh, I bet I've got one. Try a dollar, Danny said. A dollar? Well, by golly, I just might have a dollar here someplace. He was still coming closer. Danny scooted back until the heels of his scuffed-up cowboy boots caught on the edge of the porch. After that, he knew only a quick scramble backwards could save him, rather than waiting for the knife to slash and hack and kill, which always happened in the movies. He rocked up onto his knees, ready to jump. There! Found one! Look! Danny looked. The stranger's hand was extended toward him in a shaft of moonlight, his finger and thumb tweezing a dollar bill for him to take. On the man's palm, crooked and hard to see but very strange anyway, was a birthmark or tattoo of some kind. It appeared to be a circle of little stars. One of them, just beneath a crease in the skin, seemed to glow and pulsate. Well, the stranger said, his voice grating as if he were tired of this game already and anxious to get back to the business at hand. Do you want the damn dollar thing or not? Danny opted for not. He jumped to his feet and scurried to the door of the cafe. Dad! He shouted through the screen door. Hey, Dad, someone's out here still in your car! Nothing happened for a long bit of time. Then a lot of feet began beating their way from inside to outside, accompanied by shouts and squawks. Danny turned before the herd arrived to burst through the door. Caught in a slanting bar of moonlight, the stranger's eyes met his. You just blew it, kid! he said, then shuffled around and jogged tiredly away. As the screen door popped open to bang against the wall, Danny saw him round the corner of the street, and then he was gone. Where? Homer shouted. Where's he at? He paused in his agitation long enough to confront Danny. If you're just crying wolf, he panted, get ready to cry for real. No wolf, Danny shouted back. He went that a ways. Homer, Wanda, and Roach looked. There was nothing to look at but gutted buildings that had once been shops and stores. Moonlight twinkled on broken glass in the gutters. A cloud slipped across the face of the moon, and everything momentarily went black. Homer propped his fist on his hips and gave Danny a furious glare. So help me, Danny, he growled. So help me, God. He was sticking a knife in the door handle, a fold-up knife like Mark Olson had once. What are they called? Butterfly, Roach chimed in to say. Give me a minute. He walked to the Bronco. Danny heard the tinkling of keys and coins. A cigarette lighter snapped to life in a quick yellow flame. Roach studied the handle, then straightened. Your kid ain't lying, he called out and pocketed his lighter again. The lock's been pried apart and there's some paint that's been chipped off. Homer's face twisted into an angry frown. Steal my Bronco, eh? Chip my paint, eh? He turned and stomped back inside, muttering to himself. Wanda followed, trailed by Danny, who was feeling pretty important now. Homer stalked to the cash register and uncovered the telephone, which was stashed under a pile of used towels. 
He jerked the receiver to his ear, dialed three short numbers, and ground his teeth together while inspecting the ceiling. Wanda drew Danny closer. Did you get a good look at him? She asked in a whisper. Do you remember anything about him? All of it, Danny said. Every bit. Homer jerked more erect. Mavis, you get Sheriff Tupper down to the Eureka right now. Somebody just vandalized my car, tried to steal it, messed it all up, Jimmy the Lock, you name it. What? He frowned, his eyeballs rotated a few times, his lips formed strange positions. Damn, he finally said. Okay, we'll sit tight until he shows up. He slammed the phone down. Fat ass bastard anyway. Public servant my foot. He picked up a towel and began twisting it in his hands. Jackie Gleason was more of a public servant than Tupper ever will be. And they're both just as fat. Danny. Danny perked up. Go do the restrooms. Hose them down with Lysol and don't be peeking at the dirty cotexes in the ladies room. Okay? Don't you be digging in that trash no more. Danny groaned inside. Dad, I don't want to... Do it now. Get. Danny scuttered away, fuming. Here he was. He just saved the Bronco from being stolen. Just risked getting stabbed doing it, and his reward was to clean up the toilets. He wished at this moment that his dad would just plain drop dead. He would regret this thought for the rest of his life. It is a law of the West that every town must have a resident town drunk. The town drunk of Wormwood went by the name of Wallace Pickford Gimley, a once genteel old fart who had lost a small fortune in silver mine investments in 1964 and, rather than commit suicide, decided to stash his brain in a whiskey bottle until the time came to kill over dead from alcohol poisoning, which he expected to happen around 1965. To his surprise and everyone's amazement, it was 1995 and he still hadn't died. Rumors about Uncle Willie, as he had come to be known, used to fly thick and fast before the town died. He was actually dead, but just too pickled to rot. He was once featured in an episode of Unsolved Mysteries. He was from an alien planet where the drunks lived for a thousand years. He was really drinking root beer. He was a vampire. He was Elvis. In reality, he was just an atrocious drunk. Tonight, for no reason at all, he was preparing to bed down under the awning of the soon-to-be-defunct Sinclair gas station just down the street from the Eureka Cafe. For a pillow, he had a stuffed bear that some kid had tossed into a trash can. For a blanket, he had last Sunday's funny pages. For a midnight snack, he had a half-eaten Twinkie and a can of hairspray. The moon shone down, interrupted by occasional clouds that threatened a thunderstorm very soon as he set to work on the hairspray. It was a battered can of Aquanet he had lucked into. Sitting on his funny pages to keep them from escaping into the rising wind, he turned the Aquanet upside down and mashed the button in. A squirt of hairspray hissed out, followed by nothing but the butane and propane propellant. When the gas was depleted, he set the can on the macadam, pulled the spray cap off, and pried out the plastic retainer with his pocket knife which had half a blade left and had come from the bottom of a dumpster down on Wilder Street by the boarded-up True Value hardware store. Now came the fun part. He pocketed his knife and leaned back against the warm cinder blocks of the station, grinning. This was going to be a double whammy. The taste of the stuff was a mixture of burning plastic and secret chemicals so hideous they probably glowed in the dark. The first whammy was the taste, the second was the effect. The excitement in a venture like this was something only mountain climbers and skydivers might understand. There was no guarantee of surviving the ordeal. It was man against nature, man against fate. Uncle Willie had been at a hobo convention of sorts in the summer of 87, where a man known as Fanbelt tried this stuff once too often. Fanbelt was widely known throughout the Southwest because of his ingenious panhandling device. Constantly carrying a broken fan belt in his hand, he would accost drivers at stoplights and beg for a dollar or two. The wife and kids are roasting in the car, he would lament. I gotta buy a new fan belt. Rumors about fan belt claimed he was worth almost 20000 when he died that day at the hobo convention. And man, did he ever die happy. Before drinking the stuff, he bade farewell to his friends, as tradition dictated, 
spread his belongings to be divided among them, took off his shoes in case he should kick or thrash or injure someone, and his shirt in case he should puke on it. Sitting Indian style under a burning New Mexican sun, his beloved rail cars casting broad shadows in the background, he purged and pried open his aquanet, offered a toast, took a breath, and tipped it to his lips. He drank it all in six gulps. His scream caused the other hobos to cover their ears. Water shot from his eyes and his skin grew ghastly pale. He tried to stand, tore out his hair, staggered around a bit with his knuckles dragging the ground like a gorilla, and began to laugh and laugh. Someone timed him on a stolen belova. He laughed for six minutes, insane, wild, gleeful laughter that infected the whole convention. Soon everyone was laughing. It reminded the former Wallace Pickerford Gimli of the death scene of Mercutio, Romeo's friend who was laughed at even as he died, mortally pierced through the heart. The time came that Fan Belt fell and laughed no more. Silence dropped upon the crowd, all strained forward, hushed and expectant. Fan Belt's pallid face was wet with tears of his former glee. A hobo made his way through the crowd and knelt at his side. He touched Fan Belt's neck. The hobo turned a twisted, horrified face to the crowd as he stood. He picked up the can of Aquanet and held it high for all to see. His voice cracking, he pronounced the dreadful news. Fan Belt had perished, a martyr to his ideals. Uncle Willie had stood mute with respect while the others scrambled for his belongings. A single tear stained his cheek. This is how Uncle Willie remembered it. He also remembered dinner at the White House. Physically hell and hearty, his brain was nevertheless well down the road to ruin. He was bringing the can to his mouth when brief thunder rolled across the prairie. The wind picked up in a sudden gust, and the storm started. Trouble tonight, Willie thought and a chill worked its way up his spine. God must be mad about something. It was when the running black figure of a man burst out of the dark to the right that he dropped his can of Aquanet. It was when the man pounded his way toward him on a direct collision course that Uncle Willie struggled to stand. It was when he heard the man's ragged, labored breathing that he turned and tried to run from the apparition, but it was far too late. The two collided. Uncle Willie uttered a huge squawk as he was thrown against the gas station's wall. His can of hairspray rattled away while his funny papers ballooned upward and were snatched by the wind. The Twinkie in his pocket would never be the same. The other man spun twice with his arms flapping and careened into the station's single gas pump as rain poured down. The hose popped out of its cradle and thunked on the pavement, releasing a short belch of gasoline. Uncle Willie groaned, slumped to the ground, tried to rise again, and lost consciousness. The stranger did the same. Above them, new thunder rippled through the black night sky as the moon was fully overtaken by the storm clouds and extinguished completely. <laughs> Okay, kitties, this has been chapters one and two of Tales from the Crypt Presents Demon Knight. Hope you enjoyed the story so far. This is a book I've really been looking forward to narrating on the channel because this is one of my favorite horror movies from the 90s, probably one of my favorite horror movies of all time. I uh, apologize if anybody just could not get through my Crypt Keeper intro. I did the best I could. Hopefully I hit at least 10%. <laughs> Um, I didn't think it was horrible, so I left it, uh, but I used his laugh. Uh, anyways, guys, yeah, so, uh, the story setting itself up. Uh, the collector is hot on Breaker's trail. Breaker's trying to break into a car to steal to get out of there. Gets caught by the kid, tries to bribe the kid. Of course, we all know that doesn't go anywhere. Um, we didn't get a lot of action in tonight's story. But we did get to meet the collector, at least. I do love that part, him talking to the sheriff while he's sitting there still on fire. Uh, perfect, just perfect collector scene there. Uh, so many great scenes in this movie that I'm hoping are also in the novelization. I look forward to reading it. I'm also really hoping that we get some extra scenes, like from the script, that didn't end up getting used in the movie. Um, plus some extras. I would love some more backstory on Breaker and the collector. And, I mean, I know we get a lot of backstory in the movie, which will probably be in the book, but I'm talking even more detail. A book can do that, give us so much more detail 
on these events, these flashbacks we saw in the movie. And that would just be flipping amazing. Uh, the next couple chapters should be pretty interesting. So I'll be back very soon with more of Tales from the Crypt, Demon Knight. Okay, boils and ghouls, until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80s slasher librarian saying thanks for listening and be sure to return your books on time to the 80s slasher library. The late fees are a killer! <laughs> Library.